Hi, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Here's your host, Representative Rick Crawford. Hey, folks. Rick Crawford here. Glad you could join us for another edition of Tune In. Pleased to welcome our friend and colleague from the 2nd Congressional District, Mr. French Hill, be joining us in just a few minutes. We're going to talk specifically about TPA and TPP, Trade Promotion Authority, tra a Trans-Pacific partnership and how the two overlap, how the two interact, and why the, they're both important to the state of Arkansas. We'll hear from him in just a minute. Stay with us. We'll be right back. And we are back. Joining us now is my friend from the 2nd Congressional District in Arkansas, Representative French Chill. Thank you so much for being here. I know you. everybody says this, you know, y'all are so busy. We kind of <laughs> are. But I appreciate you coming and making well, the time come over. Well, this is a great time to spend time with you and talk about the issues, and uh, it's a great opportunity. Thanks. Well, let me let me ask you this, because if your office is like mine, and I know they're very similar, um, probably got a lot of calls over TPA yep. versus TPP. And there was a, uh, a little bit of a kind of running those things together. Let me get your perspective on that. Let's talk about TPA, Trade Promotion Authority. Right. And let's kind of clarify and sort of separate out just exactly what's going on with Trade Promotion Authority versus the Trans-Pacific Partnership, how the two are different, and how they're linked. Well, let's start with uh, TPA, Trade Promotion Authority. Uh, up until uh, the 1930s, the Congress set tariff rates. Why? Because it was a tax. And so it went to the Ways and Means Committee, and it was purview solely of Congress. But after the tariff battles of the late 19th century and early 20th century, Congress said, you know, I think it'd be great if we ceded this authority to the executive branch under some rules. And so basically, since that time, Congress has set the rules on trade by letting the executive negotiate trade treaties under something like trade promotion authority that we passed in the House in the last couple of weeks. And that sets the rules on how can our president negotiate on our behalf on those things, tariffs and non-tariff bar barriers. To do what? To pry open foreign markets for American goods and services. So I've heard the term guardrails. Essentially what we were, we were kind of putting this in sort of layman's terms, what we're really doing is laying down guardrails to essentially define the parameters within which the president and his team had to operate. Right. Safe to say, I mean, is that a fair way in your, sure. your perspective? This tells him what he can no negotiate, uh, all the parameters around which he'd negotiate for goods and services that we want to export from our country. And it tells him what he can't do. For example, Trade Promotion Authority doesn't allow him to bring in uh, immigration issues and things like that, peripheral issues, and keeps uh, the president on the straight and narrow, which is what can we do to sell more goods and services abroad? Well, and, you know, we're, we're dealing with Trans-Pacific Partnership. Okay, here's how the two interact. Uh, Trade Promotion Authority, as we've, we've gotten a pretty good indication of what that is, but without it, we don't see the details of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So those folks who said, well, you know, you've capitulated, you're allowing Obama to kind of, you know, you, they called it Obama trade, you know, yeah. it's just kind of, a, you know, sort of a populist moniker, for lack yeah. of a better term. But the reality is, if we had not done TPA, the general public would never have been able to view the text on the ongoing on an ongoing basis of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Your thoughts on that? Right. Well, TPA again sets out those boundaries for multiple presidents. Some of these agreements take years, five, six, seven years to negotiate over many presidencies. So TPA. Yes, that's important. It's an important point. It binds Korea, not only. Panama, Colombia. Yeah. So I worked on uh, uh, someone I worked in the Congress 25 years ago, and uh, they worked were worked under uh, presidents uh, Reagan, Bush, and Clinton. So it's very, and, and so as we know, the Korea uh, transaction was worked on by President Bush, but completed, you know, uh, more recently, Panama. So they take multiple years. So TPA, Trade Promotion Authority, is for multiple presidents. And this, this agreement we voted on will govern the next president, too, not just uh, President Obama. And inside those guardrails, it now allows the president to negotiate a treaty. And he's, he is working on one in the Pacific to open up markets for American products in countries that have high tariffs. 13 of these in the Pacific Rim. Right, including things like trying to sell our rice from Arkansas to Japan, which has a prohibitively high tariff. 700% tariff, tariff Yeah, so rate think right about now. that. Yeah. This is what I keep trying to explain to people. If you talk to them about the math, they suddenly get it. Mm -hmm. Or if they just as a prohibited uh, product, some countries just won't let uh, a certain kind of product in the country at all, tariff or no tariff. 
And so we want our ag products, our beef, our poultry, we want to be able to sell them into those markets where maybe we don't have access. Like Malaysia is a country with high tariffs. Uh, that's a big country in the Southeast Asia region that we're not uh, as active as we should be. Well, we talk about the 13 countries. I believe that's the number that's included in uh, the TPP. I was uh, getting on the elevator um, late last week, and some dairy farmers from northwest Arkansas were getting off. And they had been up here because they're dealing with New Zealand and some of their issues with, with dairy. They they are uh, New Zealand is a party to the TPP. So we're not just dealing with rice. We're not just dealing with beef and poultry. We're not just dealing with uh, ag commodities. We're dealing with a whole laundry list of items that we want to see um, access to this big marketplace. Right. And again, the TPA allows, as you said, the American people and the Congress full access to the text of those negotiating documents. The Congress gets to see it before it's final. And the American people will see it for uh, really more than 60 days when it is final. It'll be published on the USTR, you know, U.S. Trade Representative website for mm-hmm. all to read, plus at the Congress. And if we, if we don't like it, guess what? We get to vote no. If it's a bad exactly. agreement yeah. and doesn't meet TPA, guess what? The Ways and Means Committee by itself can reject it before mm-hmm. it even comes to the House of Representatives. So the Congress is not ceding its authority to either amend this agreement. It can't be done by amendment right. on the floor. It's a, True. just a yes or no deal. It's a yes or no vote. But we have the moral authority that it can't even come to a vote if it doesn't fit the parameters of TPA. Right. And that's where the, the Ways and Means Committee has a lot of influence over any administration, not just the Obama administration, but future administrations. I, mean, I would argue that in that context, what we've done really is strengthen our hand as a body as opposed to sitting back, allowing the, the, the administration to negotiate what was being called in secret. And to the American public, for all intent and purpose, it was secret. Now, for us, we could go down to the secure, uh, you know, uh, compartmentalized information facility or a right. skiff, as they call it. Yep. We could go down there and view the text of the deal, but we can't. It's classified. We couldn't share that with the public. Yeah, and I tell people, look, it's classified because it's an ongoing and sure. negotiation. It's not classified to keep it. It's uh, like a gag order in a court case. Correct. It's going know. to be made fully public. It's not even. It's not being negotiated in secret because it's nefarious. It's being negotiated in secret because we're trying to get the best position for U.S. exporters until it's a deal is a deal. Right. And when the deal is a deal, it'll be fully open for the American people to review and reject or, or uh, agree or send them back to the, the table. Mm-hmm. That's my point. People can, can be sent back by, mm-hmm. by Congress. And I've started, as I know you have, to go down into the basement and laboriously read uh, the draft document, which is about 1,000 pages, including the uh, uh, kind of background information about it. It's about 1,000 pages of text. And it is very, very much a preliminary document. Yeah. We're not. This is not an imminent, uh, uh, I view it as months away, perhaps longer. Sure. Now, let me back up a little bit. Uh, you've been here six months now, but prior to that, I know you've got quite a history in a variety of different things, most recently in the banking industry. So we've been talking about Trade Promotion Authority and, and Global Marketplace. How, do, how important is this as a banker, your perspective? How important is this to Arkansas's economy? Well, you know, American... Uh, Uh, manufacturers and service providers are very low when it comes to export as a percentage of total sales compared to other countries, Mm -hmm. particularly in Europe, where they have a much more international background. So if we can improve our domestic manufacturer's sale of exports, that is just profit that goes to more jobs uh, and more opportunities and careers for people in our country. And you see it all the time. I was talking to a uh, a company that's uh, down in Mr. Westerman's district the other day, and they make a product for the oil field industry here in America. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they have gotten their first set of international orders, and they're going to be exporting this product uh, all over the third world where there's uh, oil and gas development. That's a great opportunity for our, our uh, country. We want to make sure that they could export that product mm-hmm. with no tariffs or sure. non-tariff barriers that would prevent it from being coming into their country. So it's a great way to grow your business. Let me bring it back home. You actually, as uh, you started a bank and you developed a pretty big geography, a lot of it carried over into East Arkansas, Delta uh, Trust. Yep. And so you had an ag portfolio. Did. So... You know, we talk about this in the context of how important this is for ag trade. But think about this. These global markets, if we have access, I won't say unfettered access because that's probably a pipe dream. But if we have fair access to these global markets, 
it kind of diminishes the need for a farm bill to a large degree. And here's a case in point. We're talking about dealing with Iraqis over a rice tender right now. Um, and trying to get chip away at these markets that we should be getting into, and if we're not getting into them, that ultimately affects the market price, which ultimately affects whether or not it triggers a payment under this new farm bill. So, you know, we can see that all these things are interrelated yeah. from a global perspective. Yeah, this is just common sense. I talked about jobs and revenue and profit uh, increases for local manufacturers. That includes ag producers. And if they have more markets for their crop, more ability to store that crop and get it sold abroad in an international market, there's just less chance that in any one instance we're going to have a, a price uh, challenge that's going to require some sort of triggering a, a crop insurance payment or a price support type payment. And that is really what we're all working on when it comes to uh, these trade-related bills, is getting more revenue to our country and getting more jobs in our country. Let's talk about Arkansas with respect, you know, take agriculture out of the mix for a minute. We know that's important. What are a couple other industries? You mentioned one, but two or three other industries that really are looking at this TPA, our, our Trans-Pacific Trans Partnership, and then ultimately in the future, a TTIP, Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership, uh, a couple of industries in Arkansas that are looking at this anxiously. Well, I think um, I think in the uh, uh, lumber industry, which is sort of related to agriculture, this gives us a market for uh, forest products uh, to go to some countries in Asia that uh, perhaps they couldn't now. And then all of our manufacturers, um, we've been talking to uh, manufacturers throughout our district, and they see this as an opportunity to take a product made in made in the U.S. and ship it. Uh, whether it's in the oil field area or not, ship it, ship it abroad at lower tariffs. It's those tariffs that's like a tax mm -hmm. on whether our price is competitive or not. If we've got good labor rates, a good manufacturing cost controls, the one thing that may keep that product out of a foreign market is a, is a high tariff, and that's what we're trying to beat down. Exactly. Let's roll back the clock a little bit here. French Hill, the early days. You were here in Washington uh, in the 80s, 90s, uh, worked in a couple of administrations and have actually quite a bit of experience before you branched out on your own into the private sector. Talk about the perspective that you have about then and now. How different are things now in this environment, in this dynamic versus, you know, say the, the Reagan administration, Bush 41 administration and going forward? Well, one thing is what we're doing right here in your office. Yeah. Uh, which is the yeah. powerful uh, technology in communicating with constituents. Uh, just uh, last week in the weekly blog, uh, I, I made note of the fact that we can communicate so many different ways with our constituents. And in the early 1980s, when I worked for Senator John Tower over in the Senate, mm -hmm. we, had a, we had something that was newfangled, which was called a fax machine. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, uh, but we primarily were uh, getting letters typed in triplicate using uh, mimeograph paper or carbon, carbon paper, paper and yeah. then and With doing the, the mail. With skin in there. Yeah. yeah. So uh, technology <laughs> is number that. one. Yeah. Absolutely. Communicating with our constituents is much more personal, much more available through... Uh, Quicker. Uh, and quicker. Yeah. And I think that's fantastic for our democracy, particularly in the House of Representatives where uh, House members run every two years. They want to stay in constant touch with their uh, constituents. And so technology is number one. Number two that I've noticed being on Capitol Hill is, is staffing. There are so many more people that work in Congress, uh, and but they're in some of these new areas. Uh, like security mm -hmm. or technology right. or communications that have been added talents, if you will, on mm -hmm. Capitol Hill. I looked up, uh, and in uh, 1980, there were 13,000 people working on Capitol Hill, and now the number is 18,000 yeah. uh, paid staffers on Capitol Hill. And I think a lot of that would be in some of these areas like technology, communications, media, uh, security. Well, you know, I, you know on, the, on the subject of staff, I marvel at the talent that these young people have on a variety of different issues and you've worked in the senate and now you're, you're part of the house as a member of congress you know I, I joke around with senator bozeman a lot about how many more staff members that they have yeah. but the reality is here in the house we do have a limited number of staff and they wear a lot of different hats and so they've got to be very uh, skilled and have a lot of depth on a, on a pretty broad range of issues well one thing that hasn't changed between the early 1980s and today which is that some of the best and brightest mm -hmm. come to spend a part of their career on capitol hill working on a policy area that they're super interested in and providing that kind of good constituent service that i know you demand and i demand for mm -hmm. our our folks at home who have a 
problem with the VA or a problem with Social right. Security, or they want to understand how Trade Promotion Authority works. Yeah. And what a pleasure it is to work every day with a group of young people so dedicated to their country, they'll come up here and work uh, in the Congress. Right, and for very low pay. Yeah. Uh, in, in most cases, very low pay. And so we've got some staffers off camera shaking their head going, yeah, yeah, yeah there you go. So, hey, French, I appreciate you taking the time out. To come great great to be us. with you. We'll Thanks do it for again. the time. Yeah, you Let's bet. do it. We'll be back right after this. Hey, folks, this is Congressman Rick Crawford. Are you planning a trip to Washington anytime soon? Well, we want to make it as easy as possible for you to enjoy your trip. Just Google Representative Rick Crawford and you'll find our website. When you do, click on Serving You at the top of the website and then select Touring DC. The tour request form will come up and it's easy to fill out. If you have any trouble, just contact our office and we're happy to help. We want to make your family's trip to our nation's capital as enjoyable as possible. Thanks so much for visiting our website and we look forward to seeing you very soon. Once again, I want to thank my friend and colleague, French Hill from the 2nd Congressional District of Arkansas. I appreciate him being here and appreciate you joining us today. And we'd like for you to continue to support the effort. And you can be part of the show by just tweeting your questions and comments to at TuneInAR1. And make sure that if you've got a question for us and you want to include it in the show, that you include your name and hometown so we can credit you with that question. Appreciate you being with us today. On a sad note as we leave today, got some bad news earlier this week that uh, Mr. Jim Gaston from Mountain Home has passed away. And if you know anything about North Central Arkansas, you know that Jim Gaston and trout fishing are synonymous. But much more than that, he was a great advocate for Arkansas tourism, not only for North Central Arkansas, but for the entire state and for the entire region. And so our thoughts and prayers go out, with the Gaston, go out to the Gaston family during their time of loss.